Okay. Uh, I had a request. Can't remember the person's username. Um, to demonstrate how I sharpen my Robin Wood open sweep knife that has um, that has a bevel on the outside um, and then a flat, smooth surface on the inside. Um, I don't have a dowel on me, but I can show you how I do the, the initial part, which I believe is what the person wanted to see. So as with any form of sharpening, you want to stick with your lowest grit until you get the edge geometry correct. It does you no good to switch to a higher grit if you haven't got the edge to be a true triangle and without any little secondary bevel at the edge. So if there's a nick or if you feel like it's slightly rounded over, um, stick with that lowest grit until it's totally correct. So um, actually I should use the lowest grit because this is already sharp. All right, so I tend to start at um, I tend to start at 400 grit, work my way up to 3,000, and uh, and I I fold sandpaper around a block like this. I use the narrow end um, for the sharpening because that way I can press up with my palm and pull down with my fingers and get a fairly tight fit there. Um, <laughs> um, so. Um, what else? Uh, so basically with the, this is very specific to this type of hook. Basically, um, I, I want to be leading with the, it's going to go in this direction so that the handle is pointed in the direction that it's going in. Here, I'll do it like this. That'll work better. Um, so basically it's going to be coming like this, but instead of, this is awkward. So instead, the way it looks like for me is... I hold it like this in front of my face. I make it so you can actually see what it looks like for me. So I can see right in front of my face whether this edge is truly flat on the sandpaper. So then what it looks like is this. And this is what that person wanted to see. Was because it's right in front of my face and I'm and I'm basically moving this down a little bit but doing all the curving with this block of wood with the sandpaper. Um, it's happening right in front of me. Let me move this over here. Let's see if we can get a better angle on it. Okay. So, here's what it looks like. Just like that. And because it's three inches from my nose, I get a very clear visual on if the edge is truly flat on the sandpaper. If there's no air between the sandpaper and the, and the edge of the blade, then I know that I'm right where I need to be. And I need to see that spot with no edge travel up the blade as I as I go from the, the handle to the tip. Um, so I'm paying attention to that spot where the two meet and it's gonna shift all the way up the blade. And by essentially by doing this, it's very easy, it's right in front of my face. And then I can look at the scratch pattern on this side and make sure that the scratches that I'm putting on it uh, actually go all the way out to the edge. So just like this. Now, once I start with 400 grit, or I might start higher depending on how frequently I'm using it, how dull it is, I'll feel it out. Uh, Basically, I'll, I'll start with 400 or 600 or whatever, and I'll, I'll keep doubling the grit roughly until I get up to 3,000. Um, and that way you get a pretty nice, uh, it's easy to transition from one scratch pattern to the next. So by the time I get up to the 3,000 grit, uh, I, sh I should really only need a dozen strokes like this to really get it. And now what happens is, uh, it hasn't happened here because I haven't really pushed enough metal. What happens is you will create, even though I'm pushing towards my cutting edge, you will create a very slight wire edge on the inside. And so I then have a dowel. Um, it just needs to be narrower than the radius of your curve here um, that I wrap the sandpaper around. And then I, I push it through with sort of a, a twisty motion to push that so it's sort of a twisty motion like like 
this. So I'm sort of twisting and pushing away from the edge at the same time, and that eliminates that wire edge. But this was the motion that that person wanted to see, and I told them I'd do a live story about it. It's, it's this. It's by moving both at once, which I know a lot of people really hate having, you know, everything free floating, but it's happening right in front of your eyes. And so the the trick the trick is to just to pay attention to what's happening right in front of your eyes and the way it feels in your hand. And the truth of the reality on the ground is you'll, you know, you, that's what matters. The truth is, is if it's if it's registering flat on the sandpaper with no air gap between the two and you're doing that consistently up, then that's all that matters. So that's how I do the, the Robin Hook sweep <clears throat> that has the bevel on the outside. Um, and now I'm going to sharpen these axes that I ground yesterday. Um, and I thought I'd take a moment to show you guys how they turned out. I was actually pretty pleased with how they turned out. Let me move this back over here. Better better view. Um, so I have my main axe, Granfors Brooks carving axe. Um, I'm getting everything ready for this workshop tomorrow and Sunday. So I have seven people, so I need seven axes. So there's my main axe. And then I have Um, I have uh, this Robin Wood axe that I, I took the handle down to make it thinner. Um, and I took it down in all dimensions and really all over the handle. Um, and since that time, I've I've found it really isn't necessary to do that. Um, okay, that's axe number two. Axe number three is another Robin Wood, same era, same first generation Robin Wood. And this one I just took down the handle um, on the back because what I found to be so delightful about this axe is that despite it being heavy, um, the fact that the handle curves in so strongly means that it's actually uh, very well balanced from side to side. There's enough weight back here behind my hand, excuse me, that it takes very little effort to cock it in a little bit so that it really engages in the wood. So I wanted to replicate that with these other axes that I have. So by taking it in just from the back here, I got it so it takes less effort than it did to cock it because my hand is now this way, a, a tiny bit this way. Um, uh, and this one's already sharp. Don't need to sharpen that. Very fancy birch bark sheath for it. Um, next up, ooh, lost, the little, lost the little rubber guy for that. So next up is uh, Prandi. Uh, it's an Italian brand. And this one had quite a quite a fat handle, so I was really able to kick it this way quite a lot. Um, and this actually, even though it is a larger blade than the Robin Wood, by a little bit, not by a lot, uh, it actually has an even better balance than the Robin Wood at this point. Um, then I have the, the Baco, which I was able to do the same thing. The Baco really had this big hump right here. Uh, so same deal. By pushing it this way, I got it so that it cocks very nicely. Um, and the Baco arrived super, super dull. But I filed on a Scandi bevel on it, and then I'll be sharpening it in just a moment. And then I have... Two American style axes. This was what I carved with for years. Um, and it has a very narrow, slightly chewed up handle. Um, and then uh, this was an old handle that I put on a different but also old 
uh, acts. So, um, similarly, also fairly easy to cock because these, this American style has so much weight back here compared to how much is up here. So, that for me is my salient point now when it comes to axes is I want that, um, that waggle to be very easy. So, for sharpening, this is 600 grit just because I have a lot of it kicking around. Um, yeah, bottle openers on both, Brian. Um, yeah, they're both, I guess, roofing hatches, hatchets. Um, got them both at tag sales. So, uh, once you use a file to establish that Scandinavian grind, I'm basically just doing this with the sandpaper. It's important not to go super, super fast because it's tempting. It's such a short motion, but all it takes is one slip and then you come back and you slice open the side of your hands. So nice and easy. Um, if you're using fresh sandpaper and you don't have to start with 600, really, if I had 220, uh, I'd be using that or 400, but I think all my precious 400 is being saved for being saved for the workshop. So, um, but the scratches are coming out okay. So it's just a lot of just a lot of this. Um, now I know uh, Matt White and Nick Westerman both feel like you want your scratch marks to not be parallel to the edge of the blade, so that on a microscopic level you don't create these very very thin edges with the scratch marks going um, parallel to that edge. In all honesty, I've, I have not found that to be an issue one way or the other. Um, I, I will definitely demure to their greater experience when it comes to sharpening things, but um, I found this to be very uh, productive and easy. And um, So the key with using sandpaper is not to consider it precious and move on as soon as it starts to not cut the metal quite as effectively. I'll probably use this full sheet just for this one axe, but that's why I'm using the 600, is I've got extra sheets of 600 grit. And really all I'm looking for is to remove the vast majority of the scratch marks from the file. That's why a, a coarser grit sandpaper would do this faster. Um, and then I'm looking to keep the edge totally on the sandpaper, which again is what I like about moving the, having this movable block with the sandpaper around it, is that for me it's much more intuitive to move that against the knife, or to move both it and the knife, and just pay attention to their connection, than it is to lock something in place and then have to move the axe perfectly. So axes might be made by a plum. Uh, yeah, one of these, this one is a Montgomery Ward, which is an old, um, which is an old mail order catalog, uh, brand, my, my grandma told me. And this one, this one doesn't say. They're both pretty beat up, but one thing that's nice about them is, as far as American style hatchets go, they're, they're quite light. Um, it's definitely easy to get an axe that's that's too heavy, which isn't a problem with the Granfers Brooks because a lot of the weight in Granfers Brooks is back behind the handle, remember, right? So that weight is balanced in terms of how much it fatigues you to hold the axe cocked slightly in your hand. But uh, American-style hatchets, they're not really designed for... Um, for being used choked up really close up on the neck. Uh, I've found large versions of American style hatches tend not to work particularly well um, for that reason, that they've, they've just got too much too much weight on the, the blade side of the handle.
So I'm excited about this workshop I'm doing at the Adirondack Folk School because it's uh, the first real chance I'll have to do kind of an extended form introduction to spoon carving. Up until now, I've really, with one exception, only done um, only done you know four or five hours at a time. And I think there's stuff that I'll be able to do with the longer format that I just can't do otherwise. Um, for instance, I'm looking forward to uh, covering topics like sharpening axes. I'm going to leave one of these axes dull so that we can talk about how you can take a you know, $30 Baco axe from Amazon and sharpen it with a file and really get it there. Hi, Joseph. Um, and I'm excited to walk people through how to make a club, how to get a stump, what goes into a good stump that's safe and effective to use. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, we'll probably do a, a, just a demonstration carve like I did at the Spoonosaurus Gathering, where, where I just um, carve from start to finish so that people can get a sense for what you know what you can go for, what you, what you can shoot for, um, and I might start people off with a, a project like spreaders, where we can talk a lot about grain and grips and orientation, and they can sort of make something tangible right away, and then the next day dive into a spoon having gotten a lot of that stuff under their belt. Do people have suggestions about how you would find a a, a two-day spoon carving class? What what would make it really special and effective for you? I want I want to hear. Okay, so now we're getting close. Most of the scratch marks are, are almost gone. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more. I have more for this piece of sandpaper. Um, I'm getting close. Don't be shy, people. I, I want to hear. I want to hear your thoughts on what would make for a really awesome spoon carving workshop in terms of, you know, how you would how would you go about organizing it. I'm always trying different ways of organizing the experience because I want it to be as empowering as possible to people. My goal is that people go away uh, with a firm grasp of three things. The first is safe and effective habits. How to use the tools safely, effectively. The second goal is that people go away understanding how to maintain their tools at uh, as sharp a level as possible. And to that end, I've have in the mail for me a uh, coming uh, set of strops from Tom Scandian because I decided it's time I taught myself how to use strops quite well so that I can educate other people about that. And then the third thing I want people to go away with, um, and this is something that you know a lot of my students are going to be people who, who already have a lot of woodworking under their belt, but I want, I want people to go away with a keen sense of how to read a piece of wood and coax what you want out of it in terms of the grain and what obstructions there might be and and how to design your spoon around the piece of wood that exists so that if something goes wrong you can adjust what you're doing by or anticipate something and adjust your design so that it is a good fit for the piece of wood that you have. How does that sound to people? All right. Good. Okay. So now, now that the scratch marks are almost gone, I'm going to switch up to the next grit. Let's see if I can find some 1200. If not, 1500 will have to do. There we go. And again, now that I've Remove those heavy scratch marks. Um, this part of the process should go a lot faster. 
but again, I want to be careful and deliberate with my motion. Um, starting with spreaders is a great idea. Learn to go with the grain is critical and something you struggle with. Reading the wood. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, great goals. Wish I could be there. Yeah, is that Brian? Yeah. Uh, wish you could be there too, Brian. Um, are there thoughts that you guys have on, in terms of... Um, so part of what I was thinking was, was I thinking? If I started with a demonstration of myself, let's say day one, I started with a demonstration of making a spreader. That'd be a real quick introduction. Um, hi Matt. That would be a real quick introduction to um, you know, tool safety, reading the granite woods, splitting safely, all that jazz. And then it would allow me to cover Sloyd knife safety, and that way it would be separate in people's minds from using the hook knife. Because I feel like it would be a little overwhelming to just sort of get tossed an entire spoon being carved, particularly with all the differences that, you, that the hook knife brings into play. So if I start with a spreader, I demonstrate all those things, and then... Um, Oh, and the other thing that I've decided to do is uh, I've decided to go with stumps that you would use sitting down. Um, um, and the reason for that is it just feels a lot safer. It feels like... Okay, now we're really quite sharp here. Um, it feels like if... People are sitting down, then they're just they're gonna use less force. They're gonna do fewer of the stupid moves where you really wail on stuff and aren't paying attention to what's gonna happen with the axe. So having people start with sitting down. Oh Matt, these are just all the axes that I'm preparing for uh, this weekend. This is just a, an old hatchet that I got at a tag sale. That's from Montgomery Ward, an old um, mail order catalog. Um, right, so the idea was I start out demoing a spreader. Then people can start working on a spreader. The nice thing about a spreader is that... Um, you know, if they mess up, it's, it's they don't have very much invested in it, so they can just sort of quickly, quickly move on. And the other thought I had was, you know, it wouldn't take me very long to do. There's seven people in the class. It wouldn't take me very long to make seven spreader blanks, just as part of the demonstration. That way, they would really see me do something again and again and again, and that way, each one of them could have a backup spreader blank that would be ready in case their thing didn't work out, it would help them learn the habit of abandon something early on rather than uh, rather than really stick with it no matter what, which I think is a, an important habit to develop. Okay, this one's ready. <clears throat> All right, axe number one, done. Let's do the Baco next. I'm excited about this Baco. I think I'm excited about the Baco because of all the cheap axes from Amazon, and I, I bought three cheap axes from Amazon, I have a fourth one coming. One of them was just terrible, like the, the head was, it must have been drop forged, but it, you know, it was thicker on one side than on the other, the, it, the head was not anywhere near aligned with the handle, the handle really stunk, the whole thing was too big. Um, this Baco is really a nice size. The handle is lovely and, and thin in the, the appropriate ways here. Um, and then once you drop that terrible knob, it actually has really nice balance. Um, so I know some people don't like the orange. I personally love orange. Um, coming from a Christmas tree background where you lose stuff, I really appreciate having it be a bright color. Um, 
So let's see how it sharpens up. I need a fresh sheet of 600. And I was worried after talking with Matt at the spoon gathering that it was going to, it had been a while since I'd filed an edge and I, I couldn't remember how long it was going to take, whether it was going to be something that was a real pain in the neck or not. And uh, I was worried that it was just going to take forever to file a fresh Scandi bevel on this axe. It really took, took like five minutes. Um, hi, Matt. Um, so while my, just to be clear, while my recommendation is the Granfers Brooks carving axe is totally worth spending the money. If you don't want to spend that money just because you don't have it, I really think this Baco is going to be my go-to recommendation. I have another brand coming in that's going to need a little work pushing the pushing the handle down that's from Austria um, Joseph maybe if you're still there you remember what it is um, uh, it, all of their tools have a, have a blue painted heads um, apparently it's the, the largest tool manufacturer in Austria So good. Okay. Shuffle the old sandpaper around. Oh, that's fine, Matt. Yeah, I figured I figured that was the case. Um and you know, hey, it worked out because Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to talk to people about how to do it if you don't have a sweet setup like yours. So, um, you know, it's a good good learning experience for everyone. And I'm glad you were able to help Jill's axe. That, that really needed some help. Hi, Barbie. Right. Now, when you file this uh, Scandi bevel on, so for instance, this Baco axe came completely dull, which in some cases, I, I have to say, at first I was like, I can't use it at all. I have to do stuff to it before I can use it. But it's kind of smart because it means that they're leaving it. They're not, if they had put like this Prondi axe in with an edge, it's sharp, but there's no, there's no bevel. And so, um, and so I'm probably not going to do anything about it until it gets dull. Um, which, quite frankly, isn't as helpful as having a bevel. So by leaving it totally dull, it sort of forced me to make the choice of how I wanted to have it be and then make it that way before I had a usable tool, um, which I can appreciate the logic behind that. Um, but just be forewarned, the Baco, at least that I got, got came completely dull, like n not even pretending to be sharp. Um, that being said, as I said, it only took a few minutes. And there's a picture on my Instagram of it clamped to the picnic table. I'm sure you guys have all seen it. Um, it also had, comes with a hanging loop here, and I thought I was going to keep the hanging loop um, if I order another one, but it's just occurring to me now that because I hold it like this when I'm sharpening this side of it, I should actually remove that hanging loop because otherwise it would make it uncomfortable to hold. I'm trying to read comments and look at the same time. So, again, nice and slow. It would be easy for me to slip off this block by not paying attention and then go right over my 
end of my finger or the sides of my knuckles or something like that with the axe edge. So I have to really pay attention to that. Okay, we're getting there. You'll send your knives out without edges. Yeah. <laughs> it would sure increase your profit margin. Um, I don't know why they why it comes without an edge. I I really like Baco tools. I I prefer their pruners over almost every other brand except for ARS. And I buy a lot of pruners in the year to for my Christmas tree farm. So I've experimented with all different brands, and I just. You know, Baco just has a really nice, um, no-nonsense aesthetic that I appreciate. And everything is there for a reason, except for that stupid lump in the back. Baco, if you're listening, make your handle like this. Alright. Alright, we're getting there, but we still have some heavy scratch marks on this side. Luckily, I've got lots of sandpaper. Hey, Matt, how'd your new sandpaper um, organization system work out? So again, I'm using a fair amount of pressure. I'm sliding back and forth along this entire length of sandpaper on here, but I'm being very careful not to go fast or run off the edge because it would be easy to slice open the side of my hand doing this. Awfully close. Awfully close. And again, I'm just paying attention to making sure that I'm truly registered on the sandpaper here. Oh yeah, it was a good improvement. Good. Yeah, I think you know systems like that are really. I think we underrate them and how effective they are at increasing efficiency. I've been realizing that systems that I have in place now for making my spoon blanks make it just like not a big deal. It used to be a big deal if I'm in 30 blanks in a day. And now um, you know, I made 30 blanks this morning. So I could probably do 60 blanks a day. Um, Probably 45 blanks is what my body could do right now in terms of not hurting. But in terms of time, I could totally get up to 60 blanks a day. Um, and it's just, it's organization. It's having that stuff, having that muscle memory sorted out. But it's also the organization. Watching that edge, making sure that that edge is cleanly registering on the sandpaper. And I can also watch my scratch pattern, and it'll tell me if I'm failing to hit one area or another. Okay, make sure I get this side a little bit more, and then we're gonna move up in the grit. So far, so good. The other thing I think, let's see, what does Matt say? 
Knowing that every blade got two brand new sheets of 400 and so on, each helped. Yep. It helped you recognize what went into each blade. Right, so the accounting side of it, too. Yep. Um, Matt, do you have you figured out a way to order non-mixed packs from Amazon of just specifically the grits you want? Is that possible at higher, higher numbers? I haven't um, explored that. Hey, basically there. Again, I'm not trying to get absolutely every scratch mark out of the axe. What I want is for the scratch marks to be basically gone from the actual edge of the axe. And, um, and I want there to be a true sharp point coming up from two flat sloyd bevels on each side. Um, and then I go up in grit. Wow. My hands are really dirty. Uh, you haven't really explored. You like the mix pack. I eventually use them all. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Um. Let me take a moment and plug the classes that I'm teaching. Uh, so I'm teaching three spoon carving workshops at the Adirondack Book School in Lake Lucerne, New York, just north of Albany. Um, one is tomorrow and Sunday. One is a Tuesday and Wednesday in July. One is a Saturday and Sunday in September. Um, I'm also teaching a scything, a one-day scything workshop there in the middle of June, late June, I think. Um, and then in April, I'm teaching a two-day spoon carving workshop at Snow Farm in Williamsburg, um, which still has maybe one or two spots left in it. Um, and... And as always, I also offer, um, I also offer, uh, one-on-one -on -one lessons here at my home. They had been $80 for a four-hour lesson, and I think from here on out, they're going to be $100 for a five-hour lesson, because try as I might, we always seem to go over to five hours, um. And I, I haven't been charging people more, but I really need to be. Um, so, uh, and those, if you want a one-on-one -on -one lesson, you know, it's not as much time as the as the two-day workshops, right? So it's what you're getting in the intensity of having me working directly with you. You're sort of lacking in the in the time frame to you to sort of explore things and then have me wander over and help you and then explore some more on your own on your own pace. So it's just a different pace. Um, but my lessons at home, if you need a weekend day, I'm booked out through July. Maybe I have one more spot in July. Um, and which means I really, I only have one or two more spots in September and maybe one more spot in October. So I only have three or four more weekend lessons that I can schedule for this year because then I go into Christmas season at the end of October. But then weekday lessons um, are more flexible, and I believe I'm scheduling in May right now. So if anyone's interested, it's uh, for spoon carving, it's five-hour lesson for $100. Um, it's here at my house in Western Massachusetts. Um, I've had people come from down the street. I've had people come from... Tennessee and on a road trip from Wisconsin and actually have a woman who got in touch. She wants to come up from Argentina for a lesson. So, um, and I try to make sure that everyone goes home with the safe habits and the, the skills that they need to pursue it at home. And, and I'm always happy to answer questions after the fact as well. I mean, I'm always happy to answer questions in general. 
So if you have a question, reach out. The only reason I'm going this fast right now is because I'm not going the entire length of the blade. I'm just trying to get this one little bit at the edge. Okay. Good. I think we're there. Okay. Now we switch to the last grit. What is the meaning of life? <laughs> oh, man. All right, I'll take you seriously since you asked. Uh, I think the meaning of life is to make a difference in whatever way that means for you and however you, whatever situation you find yourself is to make whatever difference you can and that's going to take many different forms for each of us because it's so personal to your own situation and i think one of the best ways that you can tell if you've made a difference is if it could be said of you when you die that you gave more than you took um, and in all seriousness, I think that that's really important. And I think that, that gets counted on the, on the small scale in terms of small moments of generosity day to day. And it also gets counted on the large scale in terms of, um, your larger legacy. So that is, um, certainly what drives me. is to create a legacy of giving more than I take. How's that for an answer? Okay. Good. Okay, Baco Axe, done. All right. Um, Robin Wood's good, Robin Wood's good. Prondy's good. Baco's good. That axe is done. And I guess I'm going to leave this axe for demoing this process on. So I guess I'm done sharpening axes. All right, it's time for me to go finish packing up and probably wash my hands. Thanks, guys.